Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Well, I don't have much of a plan, I'm sorry. I'm a bit of a disorganized futurist. Okay, I'm going to start right, right away with a little story. In 1996, I moved from Australia to New Zealand as an immigrant. And when I moved there, I joined a spiritual development group. This group was just a like-minded group of people who were interested in exploring their own inner worlds through meditation, um, inner child work, and that kind of thing. Well, one morning, just as I was about to uh, go to this group, I decided to sit down and do a meditation in my own home. And when I sat down and brought myself into a very relaxed state of mind, a very graphic image came into my mind, which really disturbed me. In my mind's eye, I looked down, and I could see my hands covered in blood. And I, I jumped up and I thought, oh my God, what does this mean? Maybe I was a mass murderer in a previous life. Maybe I am Jack the Ripper. I put it aside. It was a bit too much for me to deal with on a Saturday morning, so I went along to my spiritual group. In the group, um, I refer to her as Jessica. And it was said that Jessica had the ability to see right into the soul of people. And uh, I was a little bit worried on this day. Um, I was just hoping she couldn't see karmic misdeeds. I was a bit worried by this little meditation I'd had in the morning. Anyway, this woman came in. We sat around in a circle. There's about 20 of us there on the floor. And I was sitting directly opposite her. And she went around to each person, one at a time. And as she went around to each person, she said something intuitive that she felt about each person, because that's how she operated with the intuitive mind. And when she got to me, she didn't even say hello. She just looked straight at me and said, I can see blood on your hands. Just like that. I went, whoa. Now everybody knows about my, my karmic <laughs> misdeeds. <clears throat> Luckily, Jessica was also a rather kind woman. Um, during the break, she came up to me and she told me something uh, quite amazing. She said, well, let me tell you what this really means. She said, seven generations ago, in your father's side of the family, an ancestor contracted a sexual disease. And the shame of this has been passed down from generation to generation. And now it's contained within your mind, your consciousness field. And she said, um, she told me then some ways that I could go about trying to work through this problem. And after that, she told me something I'll never forget. She said, let's dance. And so she turned on the CD and then we started grooving around, uh, you know, bopping to the ancestral shame. Uh, she was onto something, this woman. She knew how to uh, see quite deeply into people. I worked with her for two years. And she was a quite amazing woman. Can you find Jessica today? No, even I can't. I have no idea where she is. She's fallen off the map. I can't even find her on the internet. And I've also met many other women like Jessica, and men as well, who have a very high capacity for what I call integrated intelligence. This is the ability to draw on what I call the extended mind in order to solve life, life's problems, including the ability to intuit things. Mind, in this particular way of thinking, is not just contained in your head, but moves out and interacts with other people, places, times, and maybe even other dimensions. I studied this both formally through um, writing a PhD thesis about it, and also informally through practicing a lot of the methods that Jessica and other women taught me. And I believe it's a very real human ability that all people have. Maybe not in the same way that Jessica um, was able to express it, but nonetheless, it is real. My contention is that there's been a split in the modern mind. We have a very undeveloped right brain or intuitive mind and an overdeveloped left brain because of our analytical education systems. We learn how to analyze, calculate, um, classify all these processes we learn in education, but we learn almost nothing about intuiting, about synthesizing uh, at a deep level. And we don't learn to feel and I believe that feelings are the key to developing this kind of intelligence. And it's feeling that has been extracted from the world by science. Because that's part of the scientific method, as we all know. We don't rely on our feelings. We look at things empirically. Now, here's an inter interesting photo. Well, it's actually of a, it's, al it's almost Darwin, almost. Because uh, interestingly, my assistant, I don't know where she is, she kind of muffed this one up. 
She had to copy some of my slides, and she cut off half of Darwin's head. Um, this, is, this is purely an accident, by the way, but I thought I would leave it there because it demonstrates something which I call a bit of a synchronicity. Because my next slide, which was made before the last slide, is how Darwin lost half his mind. I kid you not, I didn't make that up, actually. It's a mistake, but I left it there. I thought it was cute. Now, here's what Darwin said. Just before, not long before he died, he said, Later in life, I wholly lost, to my great regret, all pleasure from poetry of any kind. My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collections of facts. And my argument is, and my belief and perception is, this is pretty much what's happened to all of us through our education and culture. Now, the way we rectify this problem, I think, is through developing new maps. The first map I'm going to talk about is is New Cosmos. Now, in 1900, Lord Kelvin, who was a very famous physicist of his day, this is 112 years ago, he said, there's nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Well, how wrong can you be? Within five years, Einstein had relativity theory. The quantum revolution also was not too far away. And there were many other changes in physics which were um, revolutionizing. Now, I believe that Lord Kelvin is not so, so different. He's just a person in his particular time in history trying to make sense of the world. And the, the maps of the world, that we, the map of the cosmos we have today, will change just as dramatically. Now, my first prediction is, and I'm going to make a few here, our knowledge of the cosmos will expand quantitatively and qualitatively, and it will include the idea of consciousness. I learned to point this in the right direction. Now, in the universe in 1900, when Lord, Lord Kelvin was making that prediction, was exactly one galaxy big. That's what we knew. 100 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way, 100,000 light years across. How big is it today, according to our knowledge? Well, according to our knowledge, there's at least 100 billion galaxies. And not only that, we have uh, visible matter is only 5% of the universe. The other 95% is dark matter and dark energy. And there may even be multiple universes. That's a, a massive exponential growth in the size of the universe. Even the Chinese government would be envious of that. <laughs> Entanglement is another interesting idea to come out of, out of physics. It's, it's the idea that subatomic particles like electrons and photons, once they um, interact and are separated, they retain a kind of connectivity. So that if you measure the spin and momentum of one, uh, one of the particles, it affects the way we measure the other one. Now, some people have suggested that this non-locality um, could be a mechanism for explaining the extended mind, the way that mind moves out in the universe. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but what it does show very clearly is that non-locality is a part of some physical systems. So integrated intelligence is not actually that unusual. My second prediction, the, the metaphor of the mechanical universe, which dominates science, is going to change into, uh, well, a better metaphor is the organism metaphor. Now, the, uh, the machine metaphor basically emerged from the time of Isaac Newton, who died in 1727, so it's almost 300 years old. He saw it, clocks in his house, and basically his idea of the universe was based on, on the machine. And since that time, science has tended to look on the universe as a great machine. But it's not really a very good metaphor, I don't think. It's time to change this. I believe it's also a kind of pathetic fallacy where we attribute nature with qualities that are really about us, not about nature. We have no trouble understanding or ridiculing the idea of a primitive people saying a volcano or thunder is um, an angry god. But I don't think it's any different looking at the universe as a machine. It's really our universe, our world experience. Computers, cars, trains, planes, that's what we experience. And we look out on the universe and we, we project that it's a great machine. I don't think this is a good metaphor at all. Why not? Because I think there's a, an intelligence and intention contained within the universe, in the universe, just like in organisms. Um, molecules, plants, uh, etc., societies of animals, all these things have a kind of collectivity, a wholeness. You can't simply divide them up in order to understand or, um, the way they operate as a whole. It suggests uh, an interconnectivity of the universe. Now, in an organic cosmos, um, Integrated intelligence makes perfect sense. It's not supernatural or paranormal. It's both natural and normal. And the Jessicas of this world can find a place. And maybe we can even hear them from time to time. New mind. 
I'm just going to mention one particular thing here, and that is um, what's called psychic research. There's about 100 years of research into the extended mind. And one really interesting, um, oops, I didn't mention my third prediction. Mind is going, uh, the extended mind will change the way we see mind and will also eventually uh, change science and education. So once we get this idea that mind is not locked in the head, it's going to change our education systems and our science. It must. Okay, psychic research, as I mentioned. It's the research into the extended mind. Now here's just one experiment I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about. Who's ever had the feeling they know who's calling on the phone before they pick it up? Anyone ever had that feeling? Come on, you can, you can admit it. A lot of people, apparently about 92% of people have had this experience sometime in their life. Rupert Sheldrake went out and tested this idea. What he did was he got five people together. One person had to answer the phone, the other four people uh, rang. And it was done randomly, they couldn't leak any information, they didn't know who was calling. What he found was that rather than the expected 25% chance rate, hit rate, or success rate of predicting the caller, people were able to, to get on average after a thousand trials about 45% correct, which is way above average. And this has actually been repeated, this experiment, so it's quite a brilliant little experiment. And the most interesting thing is, only when the people knew each other could they predict very well who was calling. It suggests that if we know people, we're connected or we're bonded with them somehow, um, emotionally and also through this extended mind. Uh, Steve, this is another, this is another little example I thought I'd bring up. Steve Jobs, now, he died not too, not too long ago. What was the last thing that Steve Jobs said before he died? Anybody? What's that? He cracked it. <laughs> Apple TV. Well, I think he, he was probably saying, oh, uh, oh crap, <laughs> about Apple TV. Um, no, it wasn't, it wasn't um, you know, check my stocks or check Bill's bank balance to see, see if I won or lost. <laughs> what he actually said before he died, according to his sister, was, oh, wow. He had some kind of spiritual experience just before he died. And actually, this is not unusual. What, what, is, what is unusual is it made headlines that he had some kind of um, spiritual experience just before he died. Deathbed visions, uh, which occur before people die, are very normal. People often hear things. They may see dead relatives, or they may see some kind of um, spiritual entities. Uh, they often may hear voices or communications from other, dom other domains and realms. So this is a very normal. So why does it take the death of a high-tech guru before this kind of information gets uh, spread around the world? Because this made headlines and front page news in many, many media. When I die, I doubt anyone's going to pay any attention to what I said, because I'm not a high-tech guru. It's almost as if we, we only legitimate knowledge when someone has expertise within uh, technology uh, and uh, the machine world. It's almost as if this mechanistic metaphor it dominates our ways of knowing as well. Now, Steve Jobs is no better than anybody else, I think, at knowing what the meaning of life and death. New intelligence. Now, here's a very interesting domain that I'm very interested in, intelligence theory. Now, my, my prediction is that integrated intelligence will expand human intelligence quite massively. OK, did I miss one there? Oh, I did. Okay, good. Intelligence is not purely genetic. That's a fact. We know that from studies of twins who've been separated at birth. It's maybe 50 to 60% genetic. Culture, society, environment, all these things affect the way that intelligence expresses itself. I believe that integrated intelligence also affects intelligence. Okay, here's a very interesting artifact from the, uh, the literature on in, uh, intelligence. There's a particular... Um, trend that IQ is increasing. IQ in the United States, for example, between 1947 and 2002 has increased by a factor of 17.5 uh, IQ points. Visual spatial intelligence has gone up 27.5 points. That's a massive increase. And other things like math, um, general knowledge, and reading scores haven't gone up very much, though. So we're increasing our intelligence, but only in certain areas. Now, a person, this is an interesting thing. If, you, if you've got a person of average IQ, now most of you in here will be considerably above average IQ simply because you're in a university. A person of average IQ, if they went back 100 years in time, they would be in the top 2% of IQ test takers. And they would get into Mensa, the, society's, the Society for genius, Geniuses. 
So just think of that dull-witted kid you see in the class. He looks not, not very bright. If he went back 100 years, he would be in Mensa. 200 years, he'd probably be the president of Mensa. <laughs> okay, why do we get smarter? According to Stephen Flynn, the guy who developed this theory, he said, we use ideas and concepts that make us smarter. We don't think about it, but our ancestors never really used ideas like percentage, natural selection, and random sample. We use it all the time. It makes us smarter. Okay. The next big idea, I think, will be the extended mind and integrated intelligence, because it would change not only our understanding um, of mind, but the way we relate to the world and to each other. Okay. Now, what all this shows is that intelligence expands according to the demands of society and how we use it. If society says it's good to learn math and you learn math, you get better at it. If you're good, um, if you, our society and culture um, uses visual spatial intelligence like in uh, computers, mobile phones, computer games, then people get better at it. And if there are taboos against certain things, it doesn't develop. So we've tabooed the intuitive mind. So people are not getting any better at it. And there's no research in this area. We don't even know whether it's gone up or down because no, but nobody's testing it. My prediction is once we value it, it will increase greatly. And I say that from my experience in working with people in this area and in groups and helping people develop their intuitive intelligence. Okay, last, last part. Okay, um, science and education and culture has to change as a result of this. It will change. That's my prediction. There we go. Um, education is basically based on the industrial machine model. It's the idea we have a, a product, the student, they go through the system, and we have a graduate, the product. Uh, we learn information, arithmetic, um, various skills for life applications. We don't learn any inner worlds or anything about spiritual or, or intuitive intelligence. Now, this is a very good uh, example of what I call um, an education system which is based on knowledge cramming. This is a teacher's desk at, at a school I worked in, in at, at in Hong Kong. This is uh, all the test papers. The teacher actually worked in there for a while until, until he disappeared one day and we never saw him again. Um, W.B. Yeats said, education is not filling a bucket, it's, it's starting a fire. The only fire that's going to start in this system is a bonfire. <laughs> okay, culture also is a part of this problem. This is a cute little kid I saw on the train going, going to Pearl Am. I hope, he's, I hope he doesn't have a good lawyer. Um, anyway, I don't have a good lawyer either. Um, we're interacting with, with uh, computer interfaces. It's an external process. It's not an internal process. So we're losing touch with inner worlds and the body. Um, you're connected with the internet, but not with yourself. Okay. A bit like what Lawrence was talking about. You're not connected with other people, but you're also not connected with your deeper self. And the worst thing is you start wearing silly shoes after a while. <laughs> okay. How can we, be, we begin to shift this? Um, we have to connect with... with with the human spirit by connecting with nature, the present moment. These are the things that really can, um, are involved in this experience, experiences of, of connection. This is what the literature shows. Okay, we have to start to feel what's inside us. Our meditation and prayer are also uh, very much part of this process. Now, synchronicity. I mentioned Darwin's half mind before. That was a bit of a synchronicity. I'm just going to finish off here with a very quick story again. I mentioned Jessica, the woman I met in New Zealand. Well, how I met her was almost as amazing because I was, when I was living in Australia about a year before, I sat down to meditate again and I saw in my mind's eye a silhouette of a woman from behind. It had the letters NZ written on the back of her shirt. And I thought, wow, something about New Zealand. You know, I'm a pretty smart guy. I, I, I could work that out. But I had no idea what it meant. Two weeks later, I was in the university canteen. My friend, an academic, I was talking to him. He said, Marcus, there's a guy, um, a headmaster from New Zealand out here. Um, he wants, he's looking for new teachers. Why don't you send in your CV? Well, I was doing my PhD at the time in Australia, there at Newcastle University, so I thought, I don't know. Um, but I, then I remembered the, the vision I'd had. I got up, I went over to the counter to buy a muffin. And 
I gave the woman my money and took the change, and I looked down at the change, and it was a New Zealand 20 cent piece. From that, I knew what I had to do. I sent in my CV, I got an interview, got the job, and I ended up in New Zealand. That's where I met Jessica. Now, synchronicity also makes sense in a universe that's organic. But to experience this kind of um, thing, we have to let go and flow with something that's greater than us. We have to listen to what's happening. We have to let go of the delusion that we are separate, discrete entities. Because that's only part of the story of who we are. My idea of a, br a brilliant future is where brilliant people, intuitive people, and the, intu and the intuition of all of us will be more fully acknowledged. And then all these processes, rational and intuitive, can all work together. Thank you.